And it's my pleasure this afternoon to present Overcoming Challenges and POC Determination of Effluent. A couple of things about the title. Of course, effluent is one sample type uh, that we do measure with POC, POC. However, there are many others as well. Uh, and what we will be talking today about is a high temperature catalytic oxidation system or that approach to TOC determination. In this webinar today, we will be covering the following topics. History of combustion TOC, a brief history. Description of today's instrumentation. Method development and limitations pros and cons of today's methods, a comparison of applications, the challenges of today's methods, and overcoming those challenges with the model 1080 TOC. So in the history of combustion TOC, those of us who are practitioners of TOC analysis find ourselves in a long history of CO2 determination, starting back in the six, in 1630, when CO2 was first identified and brought it out of alchemy and into chemistry. Joseph Black, in 1756, uh, determined that natural air could be created from other compounds, and he used a, a measurement to measure the reduction in mass and was traditionally used to measure organic matter in soil. In 1924, Westinghouse uh, patented a measuring device, uh, which really became the forebearer of, of modern TOC analytical instrumentation. American cyanamide patents the IR gas analyzer. In 64, Menzel and Beccaro created the ampule method, which was able to measure TOC or in seawater below two parts per million. And in 65, the first commercial TOC analyzers developed using gas chromatography and then later IR detection. James Teal in 67 patents a device that looks at combustion TOC in the 700 to 900 degree C range, again using IR detection. And in 1972, OI Analytical releases its first commercial TOC analyzer. And then finally, in 1988, Sugimara and Suzuki report on a method using high temperature catalytic oxidation for seawater at 680 degrees C. And that's pretty much formed the basis of, of many of the instruments that are on the market today. As for OI Analytical's history with TOC, Dr. Alan Fredericks develops OI's first total organic carbon analyzer, the models 524 and model 525. You see on the right-hand side, the combustion TOC. So in current instrumentation today, operate at 680 degrees C, and for the most part, use NDIR as the detection technique and we're oxidizing those samples over a platinum catalyst. The combustion tube you see on the left represents a design that can be found in most high temperature catalytic oxidation systems on the market today. The combustion tube on the right is unique to the model 1030C, which is offered by OI Analytical. But by and large, most combustion TOCs uh, follow these basic uh, guidelines or, or criteria for determination of TOC. In regard to method development, high temperature catalytic oxidation really minimizes the method development to a couple of parameters. Uh, one being the sample size and TIC removal. It's relatively straightforward of primary concern is the removal or measurement of TIC and again the sample volume. And the sample volume can vary and is primarily dependent on the calibration range and the capability of the instrumentation. 
Sample sizes can range anywhere from 0 0.01 to 2 milliliters. The optimized minimal injection while keeping reproducible results. And a recurring theme that we'll see in, in many of the methods and also other instrumentation are these effects of carbon memory. So although the opportunity is there for a large sample injection, the preference is for small sample injection size. The impact on the catalyst, particulate, and especially carbon memory. And again, the effects of this carbon memory will be a recurring theme in all of the regulatory methods and is one of the significant challenges in combustion POC. In regard to TIC removal, it can require anywhere from two to 20 minutes, depending on the method. It's based on the conditions of the instrument, uh, the amount versus the concentration of acid, room temperature versus heated, or whether we do this internally versus external or offline. And then finally, uh, the analysis modes in combustion POC. We have primarily two choices, POC by subtraction, known as TC minus TIC, or TOC by sparging, or NPOC only. In the first one, we will first measure all of the carbon in the sample, then subtract the in inorganic fraction. And second, by TOC by sparging, we'll add acid to the sample, sparge out the CO2 that's generated by the reaction with TIC, and then introduce a sample volume into the combustion tube and measure what's referred to as NPOC. In TC minus IC, we first again analyze the TC, then IC. It does tend to be error prone or has the potential to be error prone, particularly when the TIC concentration is much higher than the TOC concentration. The graphic below shows an example of the error that could be associated in both of those methods, methods or techniques, and then how that error is compounded uh, to give you an erroneous answer. In the NPOC only method or approach, uh, TIC is removed first. The remainder uh, is just detection of TOC only. Uh, there is the occurrence or can be the occurrence of the loss of volatiles. So the NPOC only method or approach is only valid when the volatile fraction of the sample is at a very, very low level. And that is generally the case in most of the samples that we deal with. Again, in our previous example, we now show with one ppm uh, with the TIC removed, and if we calculate in the air, then uh, we greatly reduce the probability for an erroneous measurement using this technique. I'm going to move now to the regulatory methods and cover these uh, briefly. When we look at the challenges associated with combustion TOC, I tend to break this down into two main categories. The first one being maintaining compliance with the regulatory methods, and then those issues associated with the operation of the instrument itself. Uh, overcoming these types of challenges uh, would lead us to successful or success with the determination of TOC using combustion or TOC using combustion TOC. As a reminder, TOC is not regulated. Uh, however, the reaction of organic carbon with disinfection chemicals generate a need to monitor organic carbon in water. There is no one true technique 
that will give the best performance. The right oxidation technique must be determined based on the application of instruments. TOC is generally a good indicator of what is or isn't present in a sample. Anything of real interest requires a more defined laboratory analytical technique. And although TOC is not regulated, there are instances in which it is. And for instance, with the Safe, uh, Safe Drinking Water Act and the Disinfection Byproduct Rule, uh, anyone with a National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Permit, and the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. Uh, these uh, would require uh, a, a strict regulation to uh, TOC content. And the reasons for monitoring this, again, the reaction of Organic carbon with disinfection chemicals generates a need to monitor organic carbon. Uh, TOC is used as a more convenient method for the determination rather than COD or BOD. However, it does not replace it. And if a repeatable relationship can be determined, then TOC would provide a good estimate of either COD or BOD. Uh, presently, uh, these are the methods or the primary methods for combustion TOC, EPA 415.3, 96BA, the ISO method, ASTM 2579, 757309, and standard method 5310B. And again, to remember, these are just guidelines, not rules. They are prescriptive to help the lab achieve good results and for proof by a third party. So in EPA 415.3, it applies to source and drinking water between 0.5 and 50 ppm. It states that you must barge for 20 minutes for proper IC removal, and it does allow for combustion, UV persulfate, or heated persulfate. It defines in some detail the analysis of the samples, including the checks. Uh, analysis must always include uh, a continuous calibration check, usually at the mid-level. And samples must be preserved if the holding time is more than 48 hours. Uh, the CCC must start before the run, then 10 samples, and at the end. You have to start with a low-level CCC, a mid-level with subsequent CCCs alternating between low, medium, and high concentration. Low is plus or minus 50%, mid plus or minus 20%, and high plus or minus 15. Uh, an analysis batch is also limited to 20 field samples, excluding your CCC. Field duplicates must be run with plus or minus 20% relative difference, and your Calibration curve is at least four points above the zero. Uh, there is, in some instances, a significant amount of difficulty in running this method. EPA 9060, uh, it covers groundwater, surface water, saline waters, as well as domestic and industrial waters. Uh, the organic carbon is suggested to be above one ppm. And measurement is either combustion or wet chemical oxidation. And it only is applicable to devices that allow sample introduction by a microliter syringe or pipette. Uh, again, a minimum one blank per sample batch is employed to determine if contamination or memory effects are occurring. And that's what we'll try to show uh, later in terms of, of how, we oper how we operate the instrumentation. The fact that in this particular method, um, comes down to quadruple pit analysis required. And in a combustion system, anytime we can limit the amount of material that we have to inject into the combustion tube, the better off we're going to be. Again, this sets the IC removal at 10 minutes, uh, independent check standards every 15 samples, 
one spike to every 10 samples. And by far, probably the most widely used method today uh, includes standard method 5310. The method references uh, validation data, and this is an interesting point in ASTM 2579. However, ASTM 2579 was withdrawn because the support data did not fit the ASTM criteria. It essentially means that standard method 5310B has a limited validation data as well. So even though it states the levels lower than 1 to 2 ppm can be analyzed, there is no data other than empirical data to support that claim. Uh, OI recommends that combustion methods be confined to TOC levels greater than 1 to 2 parts per million to be consistent with experimentally and statistically multi-laboratory devised validation data. Again, when determining the method, parameters should always be noted. Combustion is preferential to organic carbon that contains suspended material. Uh, persulfate oxidation generally provides better sensitivity, and persulfate oxidation as well can remove residuals much easier than combustion, where it can build up in the tube. In 5310B, high temperature combustion method, it must be used. Uh, the minimum detection concentration is 1 ppm or less. So 1 ppm carbon is, is highly recommended. Periodic known spikes should also be run to ensure recovery of unknown matrices. Uh, the laboratory control sample must be different from the calibration standards, but from a similar matrix to improve, well, to the sample. The most modern instrument on the market date should be well within the 10% RPD on a non turbid sample. Again, the results must be reproducible within plus or minus 10%. Every 10th sample requires a blank and a control sample to be run. Periodic known spikes must also be run to ensure recovery of unknown patients. As I mentioned, uh, ASTMD 2579 does cover water and wastewater, including brackish waters and brine. It only applies to combustion. The range is 2 to 200 parts per million. Uh, but this method has been withdrawn because the validation was done on instrumentation that's no longer commercially available. And then finally, ASTM 7573. This is a method that has been uh, around for, for quite some time. It covers the water and wastewater and seawater from 0.5 to 4,000 milligrams per liter of carbon. It again applies only to combustion. And the materials tested include uh, KHP, sucrose, nicotinic acid, benzoquinone, urea, acetic acid, humic acid, and others. Uh, it states that the IC removal must be from 2 to 10 minutes. Again, uses four calibration points above the zero. Includes specific sampling handling for humic acid. And you must run an LCS at the beginning and end of the sequence for every 20 samples. This the sequence is usually a large. Uh, you should run a matrix spike on one from one sample from each run should run one duplicate with each sequence, and it recommends that an IRM uh, be run once every quarter. It is interesting to note uh, here lately, let me go back again, let me go back to 7573. Uh, recently, uh, OI Analytical has participated in an interlaboratory study uh, for 7573. Uh, so I believe that sometime soon uh, we should see an updated version of this method. 
and one that has uh, as its basis uh, an interlaboratory study and good statistical data uh, to to give us more confidence about uh, this method and, and the technique itself. 5310B and 7573 do give the lower limits for TOC by combustion in the range of 0.5 to 2 ppm. And again, uh, it emphasizes the small sample size. And here again, we see these, these memory effects uh, coming into play. And finally, samples with total suspended solids, uh, both standard methods and ASTM uh, recommend filtration and running dissolved or particulate organic carbon. Uh, samples recover the true carbon value most efficiently when run separately. Liquids in a solid TOC will vaporize so quickly that oxidation may not occur effectively. And liquid TOCs, TOC systems can potentially not oxidize all the particulate materials. And just to overview the, the methods that, that we just discussed or just looked at, uh, here gives the detection limits, their high level uh, in parts per million uh, guidelines for TIC removal. So you see that even though a modern instrumentation these days should be fully capable of that, it does not take much in, in a combustion TOC uh, to throw this off and therefore really does present uh, one of the challenges uh, with combustion methods as far as making uh, accurate determination of TOC. Again, back to the point, there exists today uh, no interlaboratory study on TOC by modern instrumentation. However, uh, an interlaboratory study has been conducted for ASTM 475-7309 and OI Analytical has participated in it. So we should be seeing uh, something later on this year, hopefully uh, as a result of that study and an update of 75-73. Currently, EPA recommends HTCO for samples greater than one to two parts per million. So moving on uh, to the model 1080 TOC analyzer. The other portion of this equation, when we think of the challenges with TOC analyzers, comes from the instrumentation itself. The regulatory methods uh, present guidelines that we should stay within. However, it's the issues associated with actually running the instrument that probably pose the biggest challenge uh, to meeting uh, the guidelines of those various methods. And with the model 1080, we believe that we have um, offered or come up with uh, new designs, new approaches, uh, unique designs and approaches that will help to mitigate some of the issues associated with uh, the analysis of, or determination of TOC by combustion analysis. So with feedback from our users, the Model 1080C TO analyzer was developed with the end user in mind. Uh, during development, it was tested at service contract laboratories, municipal laboratories, which ran routinely a wide range of both drinking water and wastewater samples. So with that feedback, uh, development and implementation of features that would reduce operating costs and hopefully improve productivity, and again, mitigate some of the challenges that are associated with high temperature catalytic oxidation. The 1080 offers a truly innovative design. 
we are trying to offer the lowest total cost of ownership uh, due to a primary proprietary combustion system that extends catalyst life, reduces startup time, and eliminates some of the sample delivery issues. Uh, at the same time, we want to meet and exceed the compliance and regulatory standards. And with a new software package, we offer an intuitive interface that simplifies operation, reduces training and retraining requirements. So here were our challenges. Um, to determine POC concentrations in a wide variety of sample matrices uh, within the specifications of the regulatory method and also the customer's SOP. Because what we found in most cases, the customer SOP is much more stringent than that of the regulatory method. In one instance, we wanted to eliminate the need for multiple calibration curves. And the reason for this is all of this is geared toward reduction of wear and tear on the combustion tube component and also save standard preparation time. Obtain POC results with the fewest possible number of injections. If we think about how these instruments work, when we inject a liquid of some matrix into a combustion tube operating in a furnace at 680 degrees C or higher, what is ever is in that sample remains in that combustion tube, other than the clean water and CO2 that we get on the outlet of that tube. So anything that we can do to minimize the amount of material that we actually have to inject into this system reduces wear and tear on the combustion tube component and it's also going to save us time. We strove to reduce maintenance costs and simplify these maintenance procedures. A combustion tube at some point in time, even the one on the model 1080, will require either catalyst repacking or complete replacement. Uh, that's a given for, for any combustion system. The frequency of this maintenance operation is dependent on several factors. The sample matrix, sample throughput, and the combustion tube design itself. So in order to reduce maintenance costs and simplify these procedures, uh, in some cases, the maintenance procedure can take many hours in some cases. Uh, but in addition to the combustion tube, we also have to think about how we inject that sample into that combustion tube and take that into consideration. So equal attention must be given to not only the combustion tube, but the interface, <coughs> excuse me, to the analyzer. So addressing these challenges, we design for ease of maintenance uh, with the following um, ideas, developments, uh, unique designs that were incorporated into the instrument. What we refer to as the smart slide injector design, catalyst guard furnace tube insert, and pulse time injection scheme, and also stop flow bypass in furnace trapping scheme. And I will cover each one of these in the sequence. For maintenance of the system, the furnace was moved to the front of the system, out on the side for easy access. Uh, you simply lift the panel, uh, take off the side panel, and in most cases, the combustion tube can be removed, repacked, uh, literally in a matter of minutes instead of hours. Uh, so first, being able to just simply get to it in order to work on it uh, was uh, an important criteria for the instrument. The smart slide sample injector, as shown here, 
it uses what we refer to as ramps in the slide to reduce friction while sliding. I'll go back a second. If you can see from the diagram where the, the bearings are sitting on top of the ramps in this position, the injection position, uh, those ramps are pushing down tightly on the top of the cap, sealing it very tightly. The port at the top that you see here is where sample is injected. And when this slider transitions to a load position, it slides off of these ramps, thereby reducing the friction on the seals that are sealing the top of the combustion tube and extending the life of both the slide itself and the seals uh, on the combustion tube or on the combustion tube cap. In our feasibility testing, uh, we increase the lifetime of the sealing O-rings from 30 days to 15 months in most cases. Uh, lifetime of the slide is approximated 18 to 24 months. Additionally, with this slide, uh, if it were to become dirty, uh, you can simply undo the clip which attaches it to the actuator, uh, pull the slide off, uh, clean it with some DI water and a uh, paper towel, stick it back on, and you should be off and running again. The off-the-shelf actuator simplifies its design, reduces labor, increases reliability, although not shown in the diagram. And this quick disconnect linkage. Uh, you simply slip the clip off, pull it up, detach the uh, actuator attachment, and you have instant access to, to remove the slide or through the cap itself. In the catalyst guard design, we use a small sacrificial tube to protect the main tube and the catalyst. Uh, this decreases the cost and frequency of replacing expensive catalysts. Uh, reduce the startup time after servicing just the guard tube. And in our testing, we tested with high salt particulate samples, verified the cleaning and maintenance, and quantified the extended life of the catalyst. Uh, this testing was done with high salt samples, 3% sodium chloride. Uh, the initial goal was to meet or exceed uh, the performance of our model 1030C. So uh, with that in mind, uh, we injected over 4,700 injections over a three week period without failure of the main combustion tube. Uh, the catalyst guard definitely helped to extend the life of the main tube as, as the main tube was reusable after the test. Uh, the guard tube, as expected, was not reusable. And as a comparison with our 1030 model, uh, it was only able to do 200 reps before we unclog uh, the combustion tube. This is just a picture of the guard tube. This tube sits down in top of the combustion tube. It can be removed. Um, as you see on the left-hand side, this was before our test. On the right-hand side, uh, as we expected, the guard tube took the brunt of the punishment from the injection of all this salt. Uh, we are able to reach in, pull the tube out, put in another tube, and continue. Another feature of the instrument is referred to as stop flow bypass injection. Um, this allows for larger sample volumes to be converted from liquid to steam prior to releasing CO2. Uh, essentially, what we've done is turn the furnace or the combustion tube into a CO2 trap. Uh, it leads to better peak shapes, improved low level sensitivity, and the longer reaction time mitigates the effect. And remember, we talked about this earlier. This is one of the most recurring themes in a combustion TSB is this carbon memory effect. Because we are now allowing this sample to react uh, more efficiently, more effectively with 
the catalyst which is in the tube and thereby removing more carbon from the sample. Uh, in conjunction with the stop flow, we have pulse time injection. Now that gas is not flowing through the combustion tube uh, very quickly, we can pulse the injection. Uh, this is particularly of use, good, uh, of use for larger sample volumes, although it does increase the accuracy of our smaller sample volumes with quick segmented injection. Uh, moving on, this just going to show some uh, representative uh, data and, and method settings for the 1080. This is by no means exhaustive. Uh, however, in some of our testing, uh, again, using NTOC, internal sparging, uh, you see the sample and acid volumes. Uh, the sample sparge time is just one minute. Uh, we are able to do this because we internally sparge the sample volume at a very, very high flow rate, uh, but for a much reduced uh, period of time, thereby reducing time. Uh, one thing that's unique to this instrument, we have a reaction time, so we can actually set the time that this sample is allowed to react with the catalyst. Uh, our default setting is typically around one minute, as you see here. And detection time, three minutes. And and we use, in most cases, just three replicates, and most importantly, no outlier removal. Thereby, we are not setting a high number of injections and only taking uh, several of those. We're able to do this, in most cases, with just uh, the set number of replicates. This for a drinking water, wastewater application uh, in which we have a, a mixed uh, tray of samples of both uh, drinking water and wastewater. Um, here we show the calibration curve in the range from zero to 100 parts per million. And again, staying consistent uh, with the method requirements we have in this case, one, two, three, five points above zero, although we probably could have gone with four, uh, in the range of one to 100 ppm. Uh, R squared meets method requirements uh, effectively. And again, uh, the sequence validation staying consistent with uh, the prescriptions of most regulatory methods the instrument blanks, the ICVs at the mid-level, our method blank, and in this case, uh, analyzing a sample at the reporting limit or a standard at the reporting limit. And then uh, just a, a representation of some of the samples that were run and 10 ppm at this sample in sodium chloride. And finally, our, our upper level uh, CCV. This is representative of the results that we can obtain with the instrument. And just a couple of other examples of uh, ground and surface water samples. These were uh, groundwater, filtered DI water, uh, storm runoff samples. Again, what we're looking for here is uh, good precision, which I think we obtained with these types of samples. And then finally, uh, one of the tougher matrices, of, of course, uh, is anything with salt. In a combustion system, uh, this is probably one of the toughest matrices to analyze. And in this example, we have a 3.5 sodium chloride matrix uh, with very good accuracy and, and very good precision at those levels. So in conclusion, I've, I've left time. I hopefully, if there's any questions, uh, we'd be happy to answer those. Uh, the compliance to regulatory methods presents a challenge for all high temperature catalytic oxidation analyzes. In a lot of cases, and in most cases, uh, the customer SOP requirement 
may be more stringent than even the regulatory method. In all cases, the biggest challenge is faced in the operation and the maintenance of the analyzer, uh, in my opinion. And to overcome those uh, challenges, uh, the innovative design features of the Model 1080 TOC uh, serve well to address those challenges. So, uh, with all that said now, I, I thank you for your attention. I thank you for your participation. Uh, if we have any questions, I would be more than happy to answer them. Hi, John. Uh, so, we are um, getting some questions in. And uh, the first one is, how long does Having some death technical difficulties today. It's it's been a challenge on this um, internet connection. Um, okay. Our first question. Our first question is: How long does it take to repack the combustion tube? If we're talking about um, startup of the instrument and installation, the, the actual filling of the combustion tube is only minutes. In the normal operation, if we're cooling down. The system will require approximately uh, one hour to cool off to uh, a, a safe temperature where you can handle the combustion tube. But after that, uh, the removal of the combustion tube, the packing, and uh, reinstallation of the combustion tube on this system will take, generally speaking, less than 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes. Okay. Good. Uh, does the TOC have the capability of analyzing inorganic carbon? Yes, it does. Uh, the instrument supports all of the modes uh, that would be needed uh, to fully characterize a sample, whether that be TOC, TC, uh, minus IC, uh, NTOC, or if necessary, IC by itself. It, it supports all of those operating modes. Good, good. Um, are there any additional kits or um, items that are necessary for various applications? No. Uh, the instrument uh, does not require any additional kits or special add-on devices, if you will, uh, for salt applications. Uh, for for any type of application, uh, the instrument comes standard with the capability uh, to to analyze a, a wide variety of different types of samples without the need uh, for additional kits. Uh, our next question is: Does the 1080 do TNB? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, the nitrogen detector can be added. Uh, as uh, an option, uh, well, as an option, yes, it can be. Okay. Uh, our next person is asking about um, a, a zero shift feature. Uh, they've used it in the past, but they found that it, it gives low bias on their CCV. So do you calibrate the 1080 with a zero shift to account for the carbon of the blank water? No, we do not employ a zero shift. Um, I, I might need to understand a little bit more in detail exactly uh, what is meant by a zero shift. Um, I, I think I understand in principle what they're talking about. Um, but as it stands now, we've not found it necessary to have to employ uh, a zero shift on the instrument. What we have incorporated on the instrument, uh, although I did not cover it specifically in the presentation, is that we do have a feature whereby between samples, we have the capability to inject a predetermined amount of acid. In this instrument, particularly for NPOC determination or analysis, we use hydrochloric acid. And between samples, while the instrument is prepping the next sample, 
we make a, a predetermined amount of injections of just HCL. Uh, HCL has the capability of being able to regenerate a catalyst, and also it has the capability to whatever type of residual material might be left inside uh, to effectively flush that out, thereby minimizing, again, these carbon memory effects. Uh, the other feature about the instrument as well is that we do obtain uh, what I believe is a much higher percentage of carbon removal in the first place. So we, we've mitigated initially uh, some of the effects of the carbon memory, which is what's probably leading to, uh, if I understand correctly, the, the zero shift or the shift to the zero point uh, when running blanks or, or, or coming back doing system blanks, instrument blanks, those sorts of things. Okay. Uh, what type of gases are recommended and at what estimated gas consumption rate? Uh, we, we recommend oxygen. It does not have to be high purity oxygen. Uh, 99.995 purity uh, is sufficient for this instrument. Uh, nominally, we are flowing at 100 milliliters per minute in carrier flow. This does employ uh, a permeation tube as a dryer. So on the order of 350 to 400 milliliters per minute uh, in, in that range, nominally 350 milliliters per minute. Okay, and, and what is the max number of samples that can be loaded on the auto sampler at a time? It is an 88 position auto sampler. Uh, we offer an 88 position rotary auto sampler that sits underneath the instrument, uh, thereby vertically stacking uh, the instrument and the auto sampler instead of uh, placing the auto sampler left to right in conserving bench space. But that auto sampler has 88 positions. Well, good. Um, well, we'd like to thank everyone uh, for joining us today. This is about all the time we have. Um, but please contact us if you have any other questions. John would be happy to get back with you. Um, and keep an eye out for uh, our other upcoming TOC webinars, and we're looking forward to uh, uh, you joining us again. Thank you very much, and have a great day.